Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. There's something inherently chilling about old orphanages. Maybe it's the association with heartbroken and lonely children. Or perhaps it's the ghostly tales that seem to cling to these eerie buildings. The stories of haunted orphanages aren't just campfire tales. They're based on real-life tragedies and unexplained phenomena that continue to haunt these sites to this day. From the chilling cries of orphans in Raleigh's Crybaby Lane to the ghostly apparitions at Liverpool's Siemens Orphan Institution, these places are steeped in sorrow and mystery. Tonight, we'll peek into the darkest corners of some of the world's most haunted orphanages and learn some of the tragic history that might be causing the supernatural occurrences in places like Guthrie's Boys' Home in Oklahoma and the Old Orphanage in Savannah, Georgia. These locations aren't just abandoned buildings, they're repositories of restless spirits and disturbing echoes of the past. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… If only these walls could talk, we've heard people say. But what if the walls could talk? In the world of paranormal investigations, the stone tape theory is gaining recognition, or at least raising eyebrows and intrigue. Could the walls of your home have recorded your horrific death and then replay that scene as a haunting? One thing is for sure in this life, and that is your life will eventually cease. How you go out could make or break your legacy. Freak accidents are something you'd probably want to avoid, but they happen, and I have a few examples to share. In the misty expanse of Bodmin Moor, a tragic tale of love, jealousy, and murder unfolded in 1844. When Charlotte Demond's lifeless body was found, all eyes turned to her lover, Matthew Weeks, whose subsequent execution left many questioning his guilt. The Urantia Book, a fascinating and controversial text that blends science, religion, and philosophy into a cosmic narrative of divine beings and celestial order. But no one knows who wrote it. Later in the episode, I'm trying something new by telling a true story of old murder in an old detective style. I call it Murder Noir, and tonight's case will be the death of Jeanette Ernest in Fort Worth in 1954. I'm calling it The Case of the Obsessed Uncle. On Monday, the 17th of October, 1814, a terrible disaster claimed the lives of at least eight people. A bizarre industrial accident resulted in the release of a tsunami onto the streets of London, comprised entirely of beer. But first, we'll explore chilling stories of haunted orphanages where the echoes of heartbroken and lonely children linger long after the buildings have been abandoned. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Old orphanages have a way of sending chills down your spine. Maybe it's the thought of heartbroken, lonely children who once called these places home. Or perhaps it's the eerie stories of restless spirits that linger long after the buildings have been abandoned. Scary orphanage stories abound, and many of them feature ghosts of children who met tragic ends. These tales aren't just the stuff of campfire fodder, 
They are based on real-life tragedies that occurred at these haunted orphanages and abandoned sites around the world. If you're brave enough, you can even visit some of these locations. Just be prepared for what might follow you home. One of the most infamous haunted orphanages is the Liverpool Seamen's Orphan Institution in England. This Victorian building, which later became a mental institution, is a magnet for ghost hunters. It originally housed 400 orphans who were often subjected to harsh punishments like being locked in unlit, naughty cupboards in an attic corridor if they misbehaved. Closed by the city council in 1997, the building has since been a hotspot for paranormal activity. Ghost sightings are common, particularly on the roof and in Ward G. Visitors have reported hearing dragging noises in the dining room and feeling uneasy in the basement. A popular photo allegedly shows a small ghost girl crying in a window, adding to the spine-tingling lore of this eerie place. Raleigh's Crybaby Lane was once the site of a Roman Catholic orphanage. In 1958, a fire broke out in the dormitory, killing many of the orphans and leaving only a patch of grass and the cornerstone of the original building. Neighbors continued to report the smell of smoke long after the fire was extinguished, and those who walked through the field often felt suffocated. The most chilling reports are of the cries and screams of orphan children. Today, the surrounding houses are abandoned, adding to the desolate atmosphere of Crybaby Lane. The Guthrie Boys' Home in Oklahoma has a dark history of its own. Opened in the early 1920s, the orphanage was the site of several tragedies, including the suicide of an employee in the bell tower and the abusive reign of a nursemaid who reportedly killed several boys. The orphanage closed in 1978, but visitors still report hearing footsteps in the bell tower, bells ringing, even gasping sounds. The screams of boys and the ghost of the nursemaid are said to haunt the main entryway, making the Guthrie Boys' home a truly terrifying place. In Australia, St. John's Orphanage in Goulburn is known as one of the most haunted locations in the country. Opened by the Sisters of Mercy and the Catholic Church in 1905, it housed up to 200 boys who were often treated cruelly and used as labor. They were given only one set of clothing and were regularly beaten and caned. Neglect was rampant and many boys received little education. Today, disturbing messages can be found scrawled on the walls, and the spirits of the boys are said to still roam the premises. Built in 1810, the old orphanage in Savannah, Georgia once served as an all-girls orphanage. A fire tragically claimed the lives of 11 out of 17 girls who lived there. Today, the owners of the property claim to hear young girls singing and playing, and they often find items mysteriously moved around the rooms. The lingering presence of the girls makes this orphanage one of Savannah's most haunted sites. According to Ohio legend, Gore Orphanage in Vermilion burned down in the 1800s, killing all the children inside. The fire's cause remains a mystery, with rumors suggesting it was started by a disgruntled employee or the owner himself to collect insurance money. The site is now abandoned but visitors claim to see ghostly children frolicking in the woods, smell burning flesh, and hear the screams of children. Tiny handprints have even been found on parked cars, adding to the eerie atmosphere. The Oddfellows' home in Liberty, Missouri was constructed in 1900 as a place for the unfortunate, including orphans. Run by the Independent Order of Oddfellows, or IOOF, the home has a dark reputation with many residents buried in its cemetery. Some believe the IOOF engaged in sinister practices, using human remains in their rituals, which supposedly disturbed the spirits. Today, the site is a winery, but the ghosts of the past are said to still haunt the location. The Montana Children's Center, also known as the Twin Bridges Orphanage, was established in the 1890s during the mining boom. Many of the children were orphans or abandoned by parents who couldn't afford to take care of them. Tales of abuse were rampant, with children being whipped, hung on coat hooks, and locked in dark rooms. Many perished from disease, 
and there were reportedly 30 headstones for children, though they have since disappeared. The orphanage closed in 1976, but the current owner claims to hear children singing when alone on the property. The TV show Ghost Adventures even communicated with the spirit of an orphan girl and captured footage of flashing lights moving from room to room. St. Mary's Orphanage on Galveston Island, Texas met a tragic end during the Great Storm of 1900. As the hurricane flooded the island, the sisters tied the children to them with a rope, seeking higher ground. Eventually, the roof collapsed, killing 90 orphans and 10 sisters. Today, a Walmart stands on the site, but employees report toys going missing and hearing phantom laughter. One employee even heard a child calling for her mother, but no one was found during a store-wide search. The Holy Family Orphanage in Marquette, Michigan opened in 1915 and initially housed 60 Native American children who were taken from their mothers to be assimilated into white culture. Rumors of abuse were common, with one story claiming a girl who disobeyed orders and stayed out in the cold died of pneumonia. Her body was put on display as a warning to the other children. The orphanage closed in 1965, but visitors report hearing moaning children and seeing ghostly figures on the property. The Good Servant Orphanage in Vallejo, California has a murky history, with little factual evidence to substantiate the rumors. It's said that the orphanage, which housed mentally unsound children, was closed amid investigations of child abuse and deaths. Some believe the children were experimented on, even lobotomized. Today, a housing development stands on the site, and residents claim their new homes are haunted by the spirits of the children. Footsteps, moaning, and ghostly apparitions are frequently reported. The Fairmount Children's Home in Alliance, Ohio, opened in the 1870s and was overseen by a cruel headmaster who allegedly tortured and killed some of the children. Legend has it that the children rose up against him one night in 1944 and hanged him from a pipe in the basement. The headmaster's spirit is said to haunt the orphanage, appearing as a shadow figure in class photos and looming over children's beds. The orphanage shut down in the 1990s and eventually burned down under mysterious circumstances. The Elizabeth Orphan Asylum in Elizabeth, New Jersey opened in 1858 as an orphanage for girls. It closed in 1962 and was abandoned until it was demolished in 1996. During its years of abandonment, it became a hub for creepy folklore, with the basement rumored to be used for satanic rituals. The house was also hit by a small airplane in the 1970s and partially burned a few years later. Visitors claimed to see demons or satanic nuns and noticed glowing green orbs almost like eyes in various sections of the house. During the Civil War, orphans of Union soldiers were often taken to National Soldiers Orphans Homestead in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The orphanage ran smoothly until Rosa Carmichael became the matron. Known for her abusive disciplinary methods, Carmichael reportedly tortured children in the cellar. After a runaway exposed her abuse, she was fined, but the spirits of the children she tormented are said to still haunt the building. Today, it's a tourist attraction where visitors claim to see Carmichael's ghost trapped and angry in the cellar. New Orleans is a city known for its haunted buildings, and St. Vincent's Guest House is no exception. Originally built as an orphanage in the 1860s, it saw many children die from yellow fever. Today, it operates as a hotel where guests report frequent hauntings. The sound of children laughing inside the walls, the apparition of a nun on the top floor, and spirits moving possessions and waking guests at night are common occurrences. These haunted orphanages and their ghost stories are more creepy to me than most, simply due to the specters being those of children. People who should never have had their lives snuffed out at such an early point in their existence. But if you like scares, for those brave enough to explore, these sites provide a chilling first-hand encounter with the paranormal. Just remember, you never know what or who might come home with you. When Weird Darkness returns, 
if only these walls could talk. We've heard people say that, but what if the walls could talk? In the world of paranormal investigations, the stone tape theory is gaining recognition, or at least raising eyebrows and intrigue. Could the walls of your home record your horrific death and then replay that scene as a haunting? Plus, in the misty expanse of Bodmin Moor, a tragic tale of love, jealousy, and murder unfolded in 1844 when Charlotte DeMond's lifeless body was found. All eyes turned to her lover, Matthew Weeks, whose subsequent execution left many questioning his guilt. But first, the Orantia Book, a fascinating and controversial text that blends science, religion, and philosophy into a cosmic narrative of divine beings and celestial order. But no one knows who wrote it. That story is up next. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Have you ever wondered about the deeper meanings of life, the universe, and everything? If you just answered me with the number 42, I get it, but that's not where we're going with this. Many people seek answers to philosophical and profound questions, and one intriguing source that aims to provide such answers is the Urantia Book. This tome, which emerged in the early 20th century, claims to offer an expanded view of the cosmos the nature of divinity and humanity's role in the grand scheme of existence. But what exactly is the Urantia book, and why has it sparked both interest and controversy? The Urantia book is a complex and fascinating text that presents itself as the work of celestial beings. Its authorship remains a mystery, with some suggesting it was divinely inspired, while others believe it was penned by various human authors possibly drawing from existing theological and philosophical works. Published in 1955, the book's origins are shrouded in mystery and it's been noted for containing passages that appear similar to earlier sources, raising questions about originality and even plagiarism. At the heart of the Urantia book is a bold attempt to harmonize science, religion, and philosophy into a coherent worldview. This synthesis suggests that these fields are not separate but interconnected, each contributing to a greater understanding of truth. The book's title, Urantia, refers to our planet Earth, and its intent is to present enlarged concepts and advanced truth to its readers. One of the most ambitious and controversial aspects of the Urantia book is its depiction of a universe teeming with life, governed by a complex hierarchy of celestial beings. According to the book, these beings are organized into a structured society that mirrors human societal structures but on a cosmic scale. At the pinnacle of this hierarchy are the Paradise Deities, the Universal Father, the Eternal Son, and the Infinite Spirit. These entities are portrayed as the ultimate authority in the universe and the source of all creation. Below the Paradise Deities are various orders of celestial beings including the Master Spirits, the Ancients of Days, and the Creator Sons and Creative Mother Spirits, 
who oversee the local universes. Each local universe, such as our own, is an administrative unit with the Grand Universe where evolutionary planets like Earth are situated. The Urantia book also introduces unique entities like the celestial artisans who are responsible for the artistic and spiritual embellishment of the universe. These artisans, composed of teacher personalities and descending mortals, work across various domains, including celestial music, divine architecture, and energy manipulation. One of the most compelling sections of the Urantia book is its detailed account of the life and teachings of Jesus. This portrayal aims to strip away centuries of doctrinal additions presenting a Jesus who is both divine and human, embodying the highest ideals of love and service. The book encourages readers to follow Jesus by sharing his faith and committing to a life of unselfish service. The Urantia book's approach to cosmology is equally bold, offering explanations for the origin and structure of the universe that blend spiritual insight with speculative science. For instance, the book describes electrons being made up of 100 smaller units called ultimatons, predating discoveries of subatomic particles like quarks. It also proposes a dynamic living universe with cycles of expansion and contraction, a concept somewhat akin to modern theories of cosmic inflation and contraction. Additionally, the Urantia book mentions dark gravity bodies which it describes as objects so dense that light cannot escape them. This description bears a resemblance to modern scientific understanding of black holes, which serve as a counterbalance to material creation in the universe. The Urantia book's unique blend of spiritual, philosophical, and scientific ideas has garnered both praise and criticism. Some readers find inspiration in its pages viewing it as a source of profound spiritual insight and a call to personal growth. Others, however, are skeptical of its origins and the veracity of its claims. The lack of clear historical documentation and the similarities to earlier works have led some to question its originality and intellectual integrity. Despite the controversies, the Urantia book has developed a dedicated following. Readers like Mark Wilson express profound appreciation for the book, highlighting its ability to explain complex scientific and spiritual concepts in a way that transcends existing literature. According to Wilson, the book provides a sense of guidance and empowerment, encouraging readers to embrace a universal brotherhood and a deeper understanding of existence. For those looking to explore the vast landscape of spiritual, philosophical, and scientific thought in an unconventional way, the Urantia book offers a unique journey. Whether approached with curiosity, skepticism, or a desire for deeper understanding, this tome challenges conventional boundaries of belief and knowledge. It presents a vision of a universe filled with meaning and purpose, where science, religion, and philosophy are intertwined in the quest for truth. While its origins and claims may be debated, its impact on readers seeking answers to life's big questions is undeniable. Although nowhere in the text does it say the answer is 42, so I would take it all with a bit of skepticism. It all began in 1842 when Charlotte de Mond, a young domestic servant, started her job at Penhale Farm near Bodmin Moor in England. The farm was owned by a 61-year-old widow, Mrs. Peter, and her son. In addition to Charlotte, there were two other live-in farmhands, John Stevens and Matthew Weeks, both in their early 20s. Weeks had worked on the farm for seven years. The town knew that Charlotte and Matthew were dating even before she started working there. While Matthews bore the scars of acne and had a limp, he was known for dressing impressively. However, Matthew had a rival for Charlotte's affections. Thomas Prout, the nephew of the farm's owner, often assisted with the work and was rumored to be interested in Charlotte. It was said that Prout wanted to rescue Charlotte from her life of labor and possibly elope with her. Despite this, Prout and Weeks got along well, but tensions began to rise when Prout took a liking to Charlotte. On April 14, 1844, Charlotte finished her shift at the farm. Since it was a Sunday, she dressed in a fine outfit, complete with a red shawl, 
while Matthew wore a collared shirt and clean stockings. Charlotte was seen having a private conversation with Thomas Prout before setting off with Matthew. Isaac Corey, a local farmer, reported seeing Matthew with a young woman in a green-striped dress, identifying Matthew by his limp. Everyone assumed that Charlotte was with him since they left together. When Matthew returned to the farm alone later that day, Mrs. Peter questioned him about Charlotte's whereabouts. He claimed ignorance, stating he didn't know where she was. His muddy stockings and the new tears in his shirt, along with a missing button, aroused suspicion among the farm staff. Days passed with no sign of Charlotte, and Weeks insisted that he had not been near the moor. He later claimed that Charlotte had taken a job in Blissland, a nearby village. Ten days after Charlotte disappeared, the village's concern reached its peak. They organized a search party and investigated Matthew's claims. The supposed job offer in Blissland turned out to be false, and suspicion grew. Eventually, Charlotte's body was found, lying flat on her back by the River Allen. Her throat had been slashed deeply, indicating a brutal murder. Authorities issued a murder warrant for Matthew Weeks, but he was nowhere to be found. He was eventually located at his sister's house in Plymouth, leading to his arrest. Matthew was brought back to Bodeman Assizes for trial. His changing testimony and the unsubstantiated details he provided did not help his case. Witnesses placed him with a woman matching Charlotte's description, and boot prints near the crime scene matched his boots. The jury took only 35 minutes to find him guilty, and he was sentenced to death. On August 12, 1844, Matthew Weeks was hanged at Bodeman Jail in front of a crowd of about 20,000 people. During the investigation, it emerged that Charlotte had planned to meet Thomas Prout at the Tremail Chapel later that evening, leading some to believe that Matthew was innocent and wrongly executed. Many say that his ghost roams the area around the jail, seeking justice. Before his execution, Matthew dictated a letter that read, I hope young men will take a warning by me and not put too much confidence in young women, the same as I did, and I hope young females will take the same by young men. I loved that girl as dear as I loved my life, and after all the kind treatment I have showed her, and then she said she would have nothing more to do with me. And after this was done, then bitterly I did lament, thinking what would be my end. I thank the judge and jury too, for they have given me no more than was my due." Many people believe this was a confession. Charlotte's tragic murder and Matthew's subsequent hanging caused a great commotion across the country. Shortly after the sensation quieted, the people of Bodeman erected a memorial to Charlotte de Monde. The tall granite obelisk still stands at the site of her murder and reads, This monument is erected by public subscription in memory of Charlotte de Monde, who was murdered here by Matthew Weeks on Sunday, April 14, 1844. The Charlotte de Monde tragedy touched many people deeply, and the tale has become an integral part of Bodeman's history, inspiring various poems and songs. One notable piece is The Ballad of Charlotte de Monde, written by Charles Cosley, a poet born in Cornwall in 1917. Here's a small excerpt. Charlotte walked with Matthew through the Sunday mist, never saw the razor waiting at his wrist. Charlotte, she was gentle, but they found her in the flood, her Sunday beads among the reeds beaming with her blood. Matthew, where is Charlotte, and wherever has she flown? For you walked out together, and now you are come alone. The Karavik sisters also performed a song about Charlotte DeMond and Matthew Weeks, keeping the tragic story alive through music. There are many rules of what not to do if you ever find yourself sucked into a horror film such as never going into the basement alone, remembering to turn on every light, and whatever you do, don't disturb the ancient burial ground. There is a long-standing myth that disturbing grounds such as tombs, grave sites, or even haunted buildings can release an ancient curse or evil spirit trapped within the mortar. 
But is this nothing more than a fabricated plot device for scary movies? Maybe not. As the idea of spirits being trapped in inanimate objects has existed for centuries, the stone tape theory posits that certain types of stone, including quartz and limestone, can preserve the memory of past events within their materials. As such, they can be likened to recording devices that play back these events. Let's dig a bit deeper. On Christmas Day 1972, BBC Two broadcasted their annual ghost story, The Stone Tape, by Nigel Neal, a supernatural movie about researchers from an electrical company who set up a new facility within an ancient Victorian mansion. Within the mansion, one room is supposedly so haunted that builders working on renovating the mansion refuse to enter, but it becomes the grim subject of interest when researchers hear footsteps and the blood-curdling scream of a woman from that very room. The researchers proceed to dig through old records of the mansion and find an account of a woman who died a violent death at the mansion, leading them to surmise that the actual stone of the walls is acting as some kind of recording device, playing the event back to them, much like a tape recorder, hence the film's title, The Stone Tape. However, the film isn't just a gothic tale of supernatural phenomena it also popularized the theory of residual hauntings. Residual hauntings, according to parapsychology, are described as an energy transference from a traumatic or stressful event into the surrounding area of the incident. This phenomenon can reportedly occur in various objects, such as the building blocks of a structure or even in a child's porcelain doll, like the case of Okiko, a doll whose original owner passed away from a terrible fever and is believed to have absorbed the ill child's energy, to such an extent that the family began to hear disembodied voices and flickering lights, and the doll is said to have started to grow human hair. According to many paranormal investigators, residual energy is left behind after many events, particularly negative ones, and the negative energy is then dispersed into the surrounding environment or objects. Parapsychology argues that this particular type of haunting is not intelligent or conscious, like with the wandering spirit of a deceased person trying to communicate with the living, but is instead an imprint left behind that can replay back to us, much like stone tape theory. These types of hauntings are believed to be the most common type that people experience, whether you are a seasoned ghost hunter or have inadvertently found yourself staying in a haunted hotel. Instances of staying in haunted locations, such as castles or old hotels, are often followed by accounts of hearing footsteps, bangs, and even voices being heard on several occasions through the same night or at the same time on different nights. The repeated action of these alleged hauntings fit perfectly into this theory of residual hauntings or stone tape theory. Hauntings that cannot be interacted with and will supposedly never contribute anything new to the investigation due to the haunting being mere playbacks of an event. Although the idea of stone tape theory was naturally born to the beliefs of those interested in the paranormal, it has also garnered a fair bit of interest from academics over the years. Charles Babbage was an English polymath, mathematician, and inventor of the first mechanical and programmable computer. Babbage, known as the computer pioneer, presented the idea that all human speech is captured in the atmosphere, on an atomic level, for all eternity, and with the right calculations and machinery, it could be possible to retrieve these spoken words. Quote, the air itself is one vast library of whose pages are forever written all that man has ever said or woman whispered. Unquote. Charles Babbage, 1837. The idea that Babbage proposed was included in one of his many, if lesser-known, books, the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, written by Babbage in 1837. In this book, his theory of rewinding the movement of particles is explored as a concept to merge the scientific findings with the Old Testament and Christian scripture. However, Charles Babbage wasn't the only scholar to tread down this paranormal rabbit hole. There have been many attempts by scholars and philosophers alike to explain this supernatural phenomenon. One such theory is that of place memory, a theory that is somewhat similar to stone tape theory. Place memory is primarily an American term and concept, 
associated with the American psychologist and parapsychologist William G. Roll. Roll suggests that locations can absorb traumatic or violent events and the emotions that go with them. Roll then argued that certain individuals could pick up on those emotions or sense the negative energy that resides within the space. Stone tape theory originating in the UK and was first explored by Edmund Gurney, an English psychologist and parapsychologist, and Eleanor Sidgwick, a leading figure in the Society for Psychical Research founded in 1882, aims to understand psychic and paranormal phenomena. It was the first society to conduct organized scholarly research into human experiences that challenges contemporary scientific models. Those who believe in stone tape theory, or those who hypothesize, share the idea that building materials, such as stone, can act as a tape recorder for past events, and argue that those recordings can manifest themselves as apparitions or sounds replaying the memories that have been stored within the walls. Residual energy may come in many forms, such as stone tape theory and place memory, but both theories focus on a similar theme – residual hauntings. Place memory focuses more so on the emotional connection between an individual who is emotionally perceiving the location or environment, picking up on energy and sensations that may have been left behind, whereas stone tape theory implies a connection between physical materials such as stone, to paranormal phenomena, such as apparitions and ghostly sounds. Place memory could be harder to prove, especially if the individual is aware of the events before visiting the area, as it could lead them to feel a sense of foreboding or nervousness that could be interpreted as picking up negative residual energy. Stone tape theory is equally difficult to study as entering buildings constructed of old stone are probably likely to emit groans and bangs regularly, making it hard to decipher if it is playback or just aged materials. However, if you were to see a ghostly apparition in said building, drawing a connection to the stone walls would perhaps also be difficult. Either way, if you are a believer of both theories or are not yet convinced, it is probably best to err on the side of caution when it comes to digging up that cool-looking tomb you stumbled across on one of your late-night jaunts. Up next, one thing is for sure in this life, and that is your life will eventually cease. How you go out could make or break your legacy. Freak accidents are something you'd probably want to avoid, but they happen, and I have a few examples to share coming up. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Death is inevitable, but we rarely see it coming. While the dream for most is to expire from old age surrounded by everyone they know and love, not everyone is that lucky. The leading cause of death in the United States is heart disease, and even if you are in perfect health, there are more than 4,200 motor vehicle deaths reported each year in America. But there are some things way less dignified than a graceful exit via illness or collision. 
While freak accidents can seem like the fodder of urban legends, they really do happen. In the Brazilian hospital of Santa Casa de Baramansa, an 88-year-old woman, Ilda Vitor Michel, died of a pulmonary embolism. What caused the pulmonary embolism? Soup. In September of 2012, Michel was admitted to the hospital after a stroke. On the 28th, a nursing technician made a fatal mistake. Instead of injecting soup into the woman's feeding tube, they injected it into her vein. Twelve hours later, Michel was dead. While the hospital acknowledges the unfortunate soup incident took place, they deny that it was the cause of her death. However, considering a pulmonary embolism is a blocked artery in the lungs, soup in the blood seems like a pretty good suspect. On October 20, 2007, Delhi Deputy Mayor Surinder Singh Bajwa died after a horrific attack. The assailants were, of course, monkeys. But as everyone knows, monkeys, as all wild animals, can be incredibly dangerous, but the story isn't so simple. As hordes of Reese's macaws had invaded the city as their natural habitat is destroyed by urban development, they've taken over government buildings and temples. A real and genuine problem? These monkeys found Bajwa at his home that fateful day. However, it was the tumble he took off the balcony during the scuffle that killed him. He died the day after the incident and the city ordered a solution be found to the monkey plague. Obviously, one of the measures taken was to train more vicious monkeys to solve the problem for them. 19th century parliament member Sir William Payne Galway had a passionate love for hunting. He was apparently a top-notch sharpshooter, too. He'd been the captain of his university's rifle team, and it is said he could hit a bullseye with his eyes closed. Unfortunately, for all his skill with a firearm, he did not have that same mastery of his surroundings. On December 19, 1881, Galloway was out hunting in the parish of Bagby. He and his companions were crossing through a turnip field when one of these wily root vegetables tripped Galloway. He fell down on the hefty harvest and sustained an internal injury that would kill him within a few days. It should be noted that at this time Galloway was in his 70s and generally in frail health. 38-year-old Toronto lawyer Gary Hoy had an inexplicable habit of boasting about the strength of office building windows, claiming them to be unbreakable. Maybe he loved architecture, maybe he liked laughing in the face of danger, or maybe he just needed something to believe in. Unfortunately, on July 9, 1993, one of Hoy's exuberant window demonstrations went awry. While in a skyscraper downtown, Hoy was showing off for a group of visiting law students. As he commonly did when the mood struck him, he hurled his body at the window to prove it wouldn't shatter. Usually this is the point at which he would bounce right off, safe and unharmed. This time, however, the window popped right out of the frame. While Hoy was ultimately right, the window pane itself maintained its integrity, he fell through the open frame and plunged 24 stories to his death. Isadora Duncan is known by many as the mother of modern dance. Beyond her incredible talent, Duncan also liked to make fashion statements, primarily by donning long flowing scarves. These iconic accessories brought the drama fluttering behind her in the wind, but they also brought about her untimely death. On September 14, 1927, Duncan hopped into the car of her friend, French-Italian mechanic Benoit Falchetto. It was a beautiful car an Amilcar CGSS, and a beautiful day in Nice, France, and Duncan had a beautiful scarf to match, a hand-painted silk by Russian-born artist Roman Shatov. As Falchetto sped off in his open-roof vehicle, the wind kicked up Duncan's extraordinary scarf. But not quite enough. The fabric wrapped around one of the tires, violently pulling Duncan from her seat. She was dragged a few yards before her friend noticed the accident. She died instantly from a broken neck. In the summer of 1518, the city of Strasbourg was overcome by a peculiar plague. It began with a woman, Frau Trophia, who stepped outside one day and began to dance. However, once she started, she couldn't stop. A week later, roughly 100 others in Strasbourg were taken over by this strange mania. By September, more than 400 had been afflicted. The city tried to support this mass hysteria by hiring musicians and setting aside space in guild halls. The plague came about for no clear reason and vanished much the same. 
but not before it claimed several lives. While the exact number of deaths wasn't documented, it's understood that those who perished had weak hearts and couldn't withstand the prolonged exertion. Some think the madness was just stress-induced mass hysteria. Others theorize food poisoning. But interestingly enough, this was not the first outbreak of compulsive dancing in Europe. There are as many as 10 other cases documented prior. Most of the deaths you hear about from ancient Greece come from bloody battlefields or happen at the hands of dramatic political coups. This one, however, feels like it's been ripped right out of a cartoon. In Athens, in the 5th century BC, Aeschylus was a pioneer of drama. Scholars today know him as the father of tragedy, with more than 90 plays under his belt and more poems to boot. Yet his death has the makings of some great comedy. Spending the last years of his life in a self-imposed exile in Sicily, Aeschylus was sporting a bald head. A bald head that must have been particularly shiny and appealing, as an eagle overhead mistook it for a rock. Hoping to use this handy-dandy rock to crack open its meal, the eagle dropped a large tortoise down below. When the tortoise struck Aeschylus on the head, it resulted in a swift death. On August 11, 1987, a peculiar tragedy unfolded in Thompson, Connecticut. One of the co-owners of the George Thomas & Sons Textile Company, Paul G. Thomas, took a fall into one of the company's machines. Typically, factory machine accidents result in a gory and gruesome yet ultimately quick death. That was hardly the case for Mr. Thomas. The contraption he fell into was a pinwheel dresser machine, which winds woolen yarn on a large spool onto a smaller one. When Thomas fell onto the spool, he became trapped as layer after layer after layer of yarn was wrapped around him. The machine works fast, so he was buried under 800 yards of wool before any of the employees knew something had gone wrong. Unfortunately, while the spools work fast, suffocation does not. You ever hear the saying, too much of a good thing? After January 15, 1919, the city of Boston understands the meaning all too well. Known as the Boston Molasses Disaster of 1919, an unseasonably warm day saw a tank was five stories high and contained roughly 7.5 million liters of molasses. As the dark, syrupy liquid poured through the streets of Boston in a wave 25 feet high, moving at 35 miles per hour, freight cars were demolished, a firehouse was torn off its foundation, and a train was almost pulled off the tracks. The chest-deep river of molasses claimed 21 lives that day. About half of these victims were crushed or drowned. The rest died in the aftermath from infections or other complications. Another 150 people were seriously injured. This incident made the London Beer Flood of 1814 look like a cakewalk. What, you've never heard of the London Beer Flood of 1814? Let me regale you with the tale. On Monday, October 17, 1814, a strange industrial accident claimed the lives of at least eight people in St. Giles, London. A massive beer tsunami swept through the streets around Tottenham Court Road, leaving destruction in its wake. The Horseshoe Brewery, located at the corner of Great Russell Street and Tottenham Court Road, was the epicenter of this disaster. In 1810, the brewery, Moe and Company, had installed a gigantic 22-foot-high wooden fermentation tank. This enormous vat, held together by massive iron rings, contained over 3,500 barrels of brown porter ale, a type of beer similar to stout. On the afternoon of October 17, 1814, one of the iron rings around the tank snapped. About an hour later, the entire tank ruptured unleashing the hot fermenting ale with such force that it collapsed the back wall of the brewery. The explosion also burst open several other vats, adding their contents to the flood. In total, more than 320,000 gallons of beer gushed into the streets. This catastrophic wave of beer flowed into St. Giles Rookery, a crowded London slum filled with cheap housing and tenements inhabited by the poor, destitute, and criminal elements. Within minutes, the flood reached George Street and New Street, swamping them with a tide of beer and debris. The 15-foot-high wave inundated the basements of two houses, causing them to collapse. 
Tragically, Mary Banfield and her daughter Hannah, who were having tea in one of those houses, were killed. In the basement of the other house, an Irish wake was being held for a two-year-old boy who had died the previous day. The four mourners were all killed. The wave also demolished the wall of Tavistock Arms Pub, trapping the teenage barmaid Eleanor Cooper in the rubble. In total, eight people lost their lives in the disaster. Miraculously, three brewery workers were rescued from the waist-high flood and another was pulled alive from the debris. The sight of so much free beer led to hundreds of people trying to scoop up the liquid in any container they could find. Some even resorted to drinking it straight from the street, which reportedly led to the death of a ninth victim from alcohol poisoning a few days later. The Times newspaper reported on October 19, 1814, that, quote, "...the bursting of the brewhouse walls and the fall of heavy timber materially contributed to aggravate the mischief by forcing the roofs and walls off the adjoining houses." Unquote. Some relatives of the victims exhibited the corpses for money, which drew so many visitors that the floor of one house collapsed under their weight, plunging everyone waist-high into a beer-flooded cellar. The stench of beer lingered in the area for months after the flood. The brewery was taken to court, but the disaster was ruled to be an act of God, meaning no one was held responsible. The flood cost the brewery around 23,000 pounds, approximately 1.25 million pounds today. However, the company was able to reclaim the excise duty paid on the beer, saving them from bankruptcy. They were also granted 7,250 pounds, or about 400,000 pounds today, as compensation for the lost beer. This unique disaster eventually led to the phasing out of wooden fermentation casks, which were replaced by the lined concrete vats. The Horseshoe Brewery was demolished in 1922, and the Dominion Theater now partly occupies its former site. So the next time you hear someone talk about strange disasters, see if their story measures up to this tale of industrial mishap, tragedy, and a tidal wave of beer. When Weird Darkness returns, I'm trying something new by telling a true story about an old murder in an old black-and-white movie detective style. I call it Murder Noir, and our first case is the death of Jeanette Ernest in Fort Worth in 1954. Up next. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. call came in on a blustery November afternoon, November 17, 1954. Jeanette Ernest, a bright-eyed 11-year-old, had vanished from a Fort Worth washeteria while waiting for her mother to pick her up after school. 
Nadine Ernest arrived to find her daughter gone, and a chill ran down her spine. She knew with a mother's intuition who had taken Jeanette, and it was a man I'd come to know all too well in the coming days. Thurman Priest, Nadine's brother-in-law. I'd been working homicide for over a decade, and cases involving children always hit me the hardest. There's something about the innocence lost, the futures stolen, that never quite leaves you. And as I listened to Nadine recount her suspicions about Priest, I felt that familiar knot form in my gut. Priest, a 48-year-old bookkeeper, had developed an unhealthy fixation on young Jeanette. He'd started attending her Sunday school classes, much to the discomfort of the minister and Nadine herself. She'd even gone so far as to change their place of worship, hoping to put some distance between her daughter and the man who seemed to be growing more obsessed by the day. But Priest was undeterred. He began coming over to the earnest home, playing with Jeanette and her siblings under the guise of a doting uncle. Nadine saw through the charade and warned him off, but it seemed her words had fallen on deaf ears. Now, with Jeanette missing and Priest nowhere to be found, I knew we were in a race against time. I assembled my team and we hit the ground running, canvassing the area and putting out an APB on Priest's vehicle. The hours ticked by with no sign of either of them, and the knot in my stomach grew tighter. As we dug deeper, a disturbing picture began to emerge. Witnesses at a motel in Irving, Texas remembered seeing Priest and a young girl staying for just an hour before moving on. At the Holiday Motel in Baxter Springs, Kansas, the manager recounted a chilling scene. Jeanette, running from their cabin in obvious distress, only to be grabbed by Priest and shoved back into the car. Bloodstains in the bathroom told a story I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. The trail went cold for a while, until a tip came in from a motel manager in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Priest had stopped there and called his wife, Etta May. The manager overheard Etta May ask about a little girl, and when told Priest was alone, she urged the manager to call the police. It was the break we'd been hoping for. We had Priest in custody within the hour, but Jeanette was still missing. In the interrogation room, he claimed ignorance at first, feigning confusion about the girl's whereabouts. But when one of my detectives mentioned how beautiful she was, something shifted in Priest's demeanor. A dreamy look came over his face as he agreed, as if lost in some sick fantasy. He agreed to lead us to Jeanette, and I felt a flicker of hope that maybe, just maybe, we'd find her alive. But as we followed Priest's directions to a dense oak grove off Highway 66, that hope began to fade. And when we found her, lying there among the fallen leaves, I felt a part of myself break. She'd been shot once in the temple with a 32 automatic, her body left exposed to the elements. Priest claimed it was love, that he and Jeanette had a special bond. But I knew better. This was the act of a predator, a man who couldn't bear to let go of his twisted obsession, even if it meant snuffing out a young life. The case took a toll on all of us. Jeanette's classmates, who had prayed for her safe return, were left to grapple with a loss too heavy for their young shoulders. Her father, bedridden with grief, could barely function. And Nadine, stoic in her public appearances, channeled her pain into a fierce determination to seek justice served. In the end, Priest was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It was a victory, but a hollow one. No amount of punishment could bring Jeanette back or erase the trauma inflicted on her family. And as I watched Priest being led away in cuffs, I couldn't help but wonder how many other predators were out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their moment to strike. The Jeanette Ernest case stayed with me long after the verdict was read. It was a stark reminder of the evil that men were capable of, and the innocence that could be shattered in an instant. I'd like to think that Jeanette found peace in the end, as she knew how hard we fought for her. But the truth is, there's no happy ending to a story like this. 
only a void, a space where bright young life once was, and the lingering question of how we keep our children safe in a world that can be so cruel. As I sit here now, years later, the details of the case are still etched in my memory. The sight of Jeanette's body in that grove, the look on Priest's face as he described his love for her, the anguish in Nadine's eyes as she fought for justice. They're the things that keep me up at night, the ghosts that haunt my waking hours. But they're also the things that keep me going, that remind me why I do this job. Because for every Thurman priest in the world, there's a Jeanette Ernest who deserves to be fought for, to have her story told. And as long as I have breath in my body, I'll keep fighting for them, keep shining a light into the darkness, keep hoping that someday we'll find a way to make the world a little safer, a little kinder for the Jeanettes of the world. And that closes the book on the case of the obsessed uncle. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And if you liked the murder noir style, drop me an email or leave a comment and let me know. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. And a final thought, wherever God is leading you today, however dangerous it may be, that's the safest place to be. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.